Good. I know. It's going. It's good. I want to welcome everybody to the regular Conservation Commission meeting October 12, 2022 of Portsmouth. And the first item on the agenda is to um, see if anybody will make a motion to move an agenda item, I think, under other business, number one, update conservation lands to number five. Six. Allison? Um, yes, I make a motion <laughs> that we uh, remove the update on conservation lands uh, to the very end of other business. Okay, seconded? I'll second. Okay, thank you, Abby. And then roll call vote. Um, Samantha? Yes. Ted? Yes. Um, Lynn? Yes. Abby? Here. Yeah. Allison? Yes. And Jeff? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Okay. Um, next order of business is uh, first I want to make a public apology that we were looking for two council, uh, two commission members at our last meeting that had both indicated they would not be here. <laughs> so mm. um, sorry to Abigail <laughs> and also to Mika on that one. Um, so. I understand it is everybody had let us know ahead of time, but we had a little mix up. We um, yeah. Next item is the approval of the minutes for September 14th, 2022. Anybody? Allison? I have a couple of corrections. Um, one is on the uh, page two, first line. Mrs. Tanner asked if any trees were being cut down, not own. And then. Um, in under other business on the same page um, the end of the first paragraph associated with sustained land care it should be sustainable land care okay and then um, at the at the bottom of the second paragraph um, on that same page appropriately incorporated into recommendations so it should be incorporated instead of incorporated. Thank you. Any other changes? No? It's, anybody want a second? I'll second. Second. Thanks, Samantha. And uh, any other discussion? No. And we're going to go to roll call vote again. All those in favor? Samantha? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Ted? I'm abstaining. I wasn't there. I'm abstaining too. I wasn't Abigail here. Abigail's so abstaining. Cheap. Allison. Yes. Samantha. Yes again. I mean, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. The chair votes yes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the work session for 67 Ridges Court. Somebody want anybody here to speak to that? Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the Commission, John Chagnon from Abbott Engineering, representing the FOIs. Um, so the FOIs uh, are looking to add a garage to their existing home at 67 uh, Ridges Court. And um, hopefully there'll be some plans coming up. But you do have plans that we submitted for the uh, application today. The first plan is an existing condition survey. The site is the last house on the left as you come down Ridges Court. Uh, there is another lot uh, before the end of the street, but that lot is primarily um, contains just a docking structure and no other structures. The house has a, currently has a uh, two driveways, uh, and the second driveway is on the southerly side, a large paved driveway that is uh, next to the existing structure, and that is the area that the this area here is the area the applicants would like to put a structure, a garage structure in that space where there currently is pavement. So the next plan is um, a titled uh, variance plan. That plan is um, a plan that will require a variance from the Board of Adjustment. The Next plan in the set, which I, I don't need you to look at, but is there for your reference, was an earlier version of the uh, addition. So initially, the FOIs would, would have liked to extend that structure uh, one more bay, um, but there was significant resistance from 
the neighborhood, and primarily it revolved around views. Um, so uh, the Zoning Board of Adjustment chose not to approve that. The Foys rethought the project, and they're coming back with this proposal for a more modest uh, addition. The plan shows that there's going to be a reduction in impervious surface. So this, these areas here are all paved areas that will be removed. The FOIs, since the submission of this plan, uh, when we do come back, uh, they are asking us to add a, another uh, parking spot on the south side here and what we would do with that spot is it would be a porous material and that would actually serve to help the runoff from the driveway that is in front of the two uh, the two garage bays that are proposed with this addition the property <clears throat> or the addition lines up with the existing house is pulled as far forward as practical, so to be as far away from the uh, Little Harbor uh, resource as we could. And that requires relief from the front yard setback. So there's a setback shown here. Uh, 19 feet is the front setback when you account for existing homes along the street and this is, I believe, 13 and a half. So there's a slight uh, variance that's required uh, from, the, from the zoning board to place the structure in that location. As far as runoff goes right now, of course, the people who park in that uh, um, paved parking area, uh, the runoff just goes off and down into uh, both the planting area here, as there are two planting areas, there's uh, a planting area immediately adjacent to the pavement and a slow retaining wall. And then at an elevation which is lower, there's a second planting area. And then um, most of the water doesn't really go into that. It comes off uh, from about halfway to the structure uh, the property, the runoff does go there, but most of the runoff in the front comes down and goes between this small landscape area here and the uh, lower wall and runs down out into this grassed area. So <clears throat> what we were thinking of doing is potentially in, inserting some sort of a rain garden there that would um, treat that runoff. And as we look at it, <clears throat> we were um, uh, looking at putting the rain garden down here. And the more that we think about it, the more we might look at potentially um, taking the rain garden, putting it at the elevation of this second landscaped area, uh, and then either moving that wall to provide a, a hard edge, less disturbance, or putting in a berm, which would require the sloping and uh, more buffer impact. So we'd be looking for your feedback <clears throat> on those, on that uh, part of the project. We wanted to come to a work session um, <clears throat> because the development of fully engineered plans was uh, awaiting um, the results of the Board of Adjustment uh, meeting. Uh, in other words, the applicant, uh, rightfully so, did not want to uh, have us spend all the money to do the final plans until they knew whether or not the Board of Adjustment would approve the setback variance. And <clears throat> uh, the first application to the Board of Adjustment for the three bay garage. There was a lot of discussion, both brought up by the abutters and by the zoning board regarding the fact that this is in the buffer. 
and um, you folks really are the the board that looks at buffer impacts and talks about whether they are appropriate or not. Uh, the zoning board's task was to talk about the front setback. So if it's possible to have some discussion today, um, we would like to uh, inform the zoning board that we came here and we talked about this project and we've, we got some feedback. So um, we would hope that you would give us some feedback that we could um, bring to the board's attention. So in essence, the project is the replacement of a surface that's being parked on, runoff untreated, um, with structured interior parking where the drips from the cars will not be subject to washing into the buffer area, and an overall reduction in impervious surface on the property. We would also expect that since the property has a uh, lawn to the um, edge of this uh, revetment that we would come back and we would be proposing a 10-foot planted buffer area uh, down at that uh, end of the lawn area. And that's an existing situation, but I think we can do some buffer enhancements with a planted strip. So um, I guess if there's any questions, we'd be glad to answer them, and we're looking for some feedback from the commission. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Allison. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand how you're going to put a rain garden in that uh, bottom tier. I'm, I want to understand what the... Uh, so I understand that you will have the drainage sort of be below that wall, but I'm just concerned about, um, you know, if there should be a heavy rain incident, the pressure would be like there. There's... Are you... Because there's a, there's a garage bay on the far left of the house as you're looking at it from the street, and you guys want to put in a new one, but the drawings indicate just one bay. So you're talking about just adding one bay, correct? Um, this it looks like a people door. From the drawing, it looks like a people door and a garage door that would, in the new construction. Hey, this one here, John? Yeah, yeah that shows, that's what yes. I'm talking about. Yes. Um, are you talking about just having one more, one new bay? Yes. Okay. Yes, I apologize. Because with all the... Yes. Yep. Three bays and two bays or whatever. I didn't. I just want to make sure they were lining up. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the the um, door to the left of that uh, bay. It's like a people door or something. Right? It's not even a, a people door. It's a pass through because what happens is. Oh, got it. Yeah. Yeah. So what you have is the situation where this uh, existing basement is at an elevation that would not allow you to continue it because you'd be below the street and all the water would just run into the garage. So that's like an air break so okay. that we can have a higher grade to the, to the garage bay and uh, a step down. Um, so yeah, that's sort of going to be passed through yeah. to the back. Yeah. Sorry if I... No, no, that was a good question. I, 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 uh... yeah. Allison's going yes, Allison. So I, I went out there and looked at the property yesterday, and it seems like it's a very small piece of property to be having all this addition on it. And uh, I would like to understand, so there's going to have to be some excavation to the road in order to be able to put this garage addition on. So the garage floor will be sort of at the grade of where the pavement is, so they'll have to dig a four-foot frost wall, but it's okay. not a full basement. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Questions? Oh, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, just 
um, what is the square footage of the existing house and what is it with the addition? Do you have that? I couldn't find it anywhere, mm. but. Yeah, it should be on that C2 variance plan uh, before and after. Um, is it on a drawing or is it on text? Uh, maybe it's, yeah, it should be. It should be in a previous surface calc uh, by the, on the variance plan C2, yeah, the top left. So it's going from 1591 to 2109. Fifteen ninety one to twenty one oh nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, structure coverage max is twenty percent, so that would be thirty two hundred. Yes, Allison. Just I just wanted to make sure that you you saw the staff report and the recommendations. Yeah, we saw the staff report, so we can go through some of those recommendations. I mean, we, we definitely don't have a full, fully designed plan, but I believe we have uh, shown all the jurisdictional wetlands and buffers. We would definitely have a full plan set that would talk about the um, erosion control and uh, limits and square footages of impacts, uh, add the landscape buffer plan, uh, provide some more information on the wetland buffer. Uh, there are no invasive species on the site that we're aware of, um, other than maybe some things that were planted, like the burning bush and the maple trees, but. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so we would be looking to add the 10-foot buffer strip. As far as wetland boundary markers, um, I'm not sure where you're going with those, but I guess we would probably not ask that the residents be uh, uh, have to endure having a stick in their yard and in their view that says wetland. And is that changed from buffer, Peter? Uh, the, the, ordinance? the ordinance calls for it to be put on the plan to show a good location for just highlighting where the wetland boundary is. So maybe there's a tree or two, like at the at the tidal buffer zone or right at the edge of the wetland. I don't know where the best location is, but it, it does call for it in our zoning ordinance. We're just trying to get people to start doing that. We're gonna come up with a more standardized marker, but yeah, you could if you can put it in a unobtrusive area so it doesn't bother them, but it you know tries to highlight to people that this is a wetland resource area. Um, that's what we're shooting for. So it doesn't have to be every five feet or something like that, mm -hmm. but maybe a couple spots where there's a tree or you could put a post in or something like that that would be out of the way. But but people that are you know going down there would see that that's the edge of wetland. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's better closer to the street where you might get people seeing it from that direction or the other street behind there, Fernal Court. Um, and it says that the wetland boundary, is that, or is uh, it? The ordinance just asks for it to be shown on the plan to dis distinguish where the wetland boundary or wetland buffer or is. Buffer. It really kind of, yeah. we kept it open because every project's a little different. Yeah, right, where right. They sometimes you want to mark the buffer and sometimes, like in this case, the buffer is up right. here. So the placard would say something like sensitive wetland area or something. We can show you what we've got. We'll yep. have some. So possibly at here. this corner of the property is a good place. And that actually is an area where the public comes down here to get to the shore and then maybe a second one over here at that boundary or yeah. if the one there on the east side would probably make the most sense and be the most uh, useful because it would the public comes down yeah, they there. go down there yep yep the digital wetland delineation file i know you're it's on your agenda so i don't know if yeah you we're going to talk about it later but yeah. um we were thinking by that that we would want we'd want to start asking applicants that have a digital file of their wetland to provide it so we can add it to our gis and just improve the accuracy of our gis um we're going to talk with the commission about it later and um see where they want to go with it but it's something that we came up with that you know we're we're trying to improve the resolution of our wetland boundary citywide, so that would help our, our citywide layer. 
Yeah, I understand. And if that uh, Steve Rikers here, you might want to talk and ask a few questions about that proposal. If you're so inclined to take that out of order, that would be uh, very helpful for him after his next presentation. And we don't expect any groundwater impacts because the uh, garage is at the grade, so it's not going to be interrupting any groundwater like with a basement or anything. And we could put a note on the plan about the storage of the docking structure. I think that's what that last comment is about. That the, and I believe that's part of the state rules. It's, yeah, that Shipping. you can't store your floats in the buffer. Yep. And I think there's the the one that he mentions right under the recommendation before that about just enhancements consisting with living shoreline. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Just. Well. I guess uh, the buffer plantings at the top of the revetment would be our living shoreline. Uh, I don't know what else you would do in this case. We're not disturbing that shoreline at all. Right. Yeah, we just want to point it out because it's in the ordinance. You're not working in that area, but um, to the extent you can enhance it, you know, it's a tricky. It's a tricky spot. You don't want to go. Mess around. Mess around too much and disturb it. So I know that's a factor too. Right. But it's something yep. to speak to for you guys just to raise, you know, that's in our ordinance and whenever there's work within a tidal buffer zone that gets, you know, brought up for us. Mm-hmm. Yep. Understand. Um, I have a question regarding what you mentioned about uh, having the new, the new parking spot be pervious. Um, Porous, yeah, porous. Yep. So it doesn't show on the plan um, because uh, it was brought up after we filed, but um, and I think that speaks to the uh, way I thought it was two and it's only one, so they need another parking spot. So what we would propose is to put in a porous parking spot here, and since that is down slope of the driveway, anything that runs off the driveway would also go over that porous section and tend to infiltrate in uh, before it even ran down to the rain garden. So I do have questions about that um, regarding that using a porous, porous parking area as treatment for a non-porous parking area can cause some complications with the runoff coming off of that area being whatever it is, sand, um, you know, leaves and everything, mm -hmm. um, and then having to maintain the porous parking area like a stormwater treatment mm -hmm. um, area. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that really is your best way to go necessarily. Mm. Okay. Lord, Might be better to just do that all in, all in yeah, that's that's what I I, yeah. regular pavement. <laughs> Or all porous. All, all porous, gotcha. Is yeah. there, would make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not sure you changed the dynamic of the amount of stuff that, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So just questioning it. Yep. Um, other questions from everybody? I don't have a question, but just something I'd like to talk about with the project. Is that? Do, do we have a discussion part of this still? Work work session? Okay, I'll wait for discussion. We, we don't do a motion, so we can discuss okay, well, it okay. right now. <laughs> um, Unless other questions. I think for me, I would just really need to see a, a really robust planting plan like you're um, suggesting doing for the 10 feet of um, buffer planting. Mm -hmm. It more would be great, um, taking away as much lawn as possible, but also with the remaining lawn, um, having it in a maintenance plan, uh, uh, you know, not using chemicals on the lawn, that sort of thing, using the NOFA standards, which Ted will bring up. So mm -hmm. having it in there already will mean Ted won't have to say anything about it. <laughs> um, Thank you, Sam. For sure. Yeah, um, it's part of the standard sheet now for these. The yeah. NOFA. Uh, yep. And uh, the mentioning of the uh, NHDES uh, um, standards on uh, 
uh, soil enhancements okay. or fertilizer. Okay. The word for that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I think those would be the biggest um, things yeah. for me. I appreciate that you're. Um, you know, I, I don't love that this addition is going in further into the buffer, but because it's going on an already paved area, I can see that, you know, mm -hmm. it might be all right. But I think just having those, all that planting, taking care of the remainder of the property as best as possible for the least amount of impact to Little Harbor would be great to see on the plans and in any other supporting documents. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. I'd like to see more than 10 feet of plantings 10 feet, 10 feet in. in and considering they're you know the whole yard is in the buffer zone basically it seems like 10 feet I'd support that is not enough yeah yeah I agree <clears throat> um, and also the NOFA I assume also includes herbicides in the um I was pretty sure because it didn't get mentioned by you just so I because that lawn that I looked at I mean that looks like that lawn has probably had some herbicides <laughs> uh, hit with it too so um, anyway we have a we're supposed to do a site visit for this right site we we're we're trying to get one scheduled at the last minute but we have time because it's it's not a you know it's got an application to come so we're hoping to do it the week before um, if you guys are open for that the week before the next conservation commission meeting yeah I mean unfortunately it didn't work out for us. I don't know if you did some other site walks last week. Um, no, no. Obviously, we'd have to submit this before the site walk. So, <laughs> right. Um, but we can make minor adjustments as we go for a planning board uh, approval. Maybe later uh, that same month, if that works. Maybe that doesn't work. You know, it probably has to go another month before planning board. So yeah, we, we'll, we're up for, we, we're welcoming a site walk the week before your next meeting and we'll submit the full set of plans. Um, yeah, you plan, the variance do you plan at, to come next month or you just- you Yeah, the variance meeting is on the 27th, I think. Okay. Uh, it's, it's before the deadline for your next meeting. So we'll- oh, Okay, you'll have submitted. We'll, if the variance is granted to allow the front setback relief, then we'll be filing for next month for your meeting. Yeah, we'll shoot for that that Wednesday before the next meeting. Hopefully, that you know, just to give you a heads up now, but we'll yep. get it up. We'll get it out early. If if you decide and not it, to go, we can postpone it. Yep, I, and you're going to do ten uh, four thir uh, three thirty. Like to do three thirty. Three thirty same time. Try to make it yeah. a regular time a week before the meeting. Yep, that's a good we'll idea. Sure, sure. Schedules. Yep. And if you do put in a rain garden or some other BMP, um, just to say that it would be good to have a plan or management maintenance plan in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other comments or questions from anybody? If we are doing a site walk, it is helpful to stake out anything, um, you know, where the addition will be, but also the buffer zone line and you know where the rain garden is going to go and how far you want the buffer planting it's just it's really helpful visually to see it on the ground okay thanks yep just all set okay doesn't look like anybody else has any questions or comments thank you okay thank That's you for your feedback thank you at the site okay next item on the agenda is the state wetland bureau application old business for 41 picturing of and Sorry we couldn't hear you last month. All good. No worries. Uh -huh. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm going to recuse myself from uh, this item. I actually uh, sublet a uh, slip there. This, so. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let me just navigate here to my plan. I was taking notes for John there. So this is a... Uh, uh, DS uh, wetland application for uh, the expansion of an existing commercial docking structure located at 41 Pickering Ave um, in, in Portsmouth here. Uh, the property owner is Esther's Marina LLC. Um, the plan set, which will be up in a minute, uh, consists of an existing conditions plan that shows the, the uh, existing 
docking structure that is there now, uh, the property owner um, at this time uh, rents slip space to boat owners. Um, she also rents uh, dinghy space to boat owners who um, use the, the, the current structure to uh, get in a dinghy and then row out to their moorings uh, that are located out in the river, out beyond the, uh, the structure that you see there on the plan. Uh, the property owner also uh, operates and runs a uh, kayak rental business. Um, so the purpose of this expansion is to provide um, her business with that space to continue to run her kayak business. Um, if you've walked by this site or been on this site, if you've rented kayaks there, or if you look at the photos I submitted with the application, um, there's a storage of about 125 kayaks on site as well as some paddle boards. So there's a lot of kayak and uh, storage racks that are on the site. Uh, she has a pretty healthy business, uh, healthy enough to, to um, dive into this expansion. Um, the expansion consists of proposing an, another gangway that's off the existing fixed pier that's there now. Um, a 3 by 40 gangway that would lead to a 10 by 70 float. Uh, you can see from this plan that uh, mean high, mean low water uh, runs through the, uh, the western portion of the proposed float and the uh, negative one foot contour runs through about the center of the float. Uh, this would provide them with um, some tidal access. Uh, it would sit on the mud at low tide. Um, it's not a very long structure by any means. Uh, it's enough to provide her with the space that she needs for her customers to be able to uh, get a kayak onto that float and also get in it. Um, I have never uh, personally gotten in a kayak, uh, trying to step into it from being on a float, but from what I understand that can be a little bit um, tricky and try to not end up wet. So uh, space for, you know, uh, a group of five to ten people who want to paddle together can all get their kayaks on this dock and, and be able to launch safely. Um, there are two existing uh, wood piles there now. We would utilize those two existing wood piles to secure the float location. Uh, they're shown on the plan as well. Um, sheet D1 is basically our standard detail sheet which shows the dock um, the existing dock as well as the proposed uh, dock expansion um, in plan view as well as in profile view. Uh, the profile um, is on mean low water datum, which means that uh, mean low water is elevation zero. Uh, we have mean low water, mean high water, highest observable tide line, as well as the projected sea level rise in the year 2100 depicted on the plan. Um, the application package itself to DES has a lot of maps and um, has a coastal vulnerability assessment, a coastal functional assessments uh, included in that as well as the photographs that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, DES will be looking for comment from this commission in regards to this application. Um, so that's why I'm here today to present, answer any questions, take any comments, uh, but in the end they would like a, um, a written uh, letter with some comments in regards to the application. Um, I did submit it quite some time ago. Um, end of July, so we're coming up on some deadlines to, uh, to have things uh, uh, hopefully approved, but uh, that's, that's where we're at. So I'll take any questions you have. I'm sure there's something I, I left out. Thank you very much. Questions? New questions. No? Yes, just just to confirm. So this the new float would be used just for launching kayaks. It's not going to be used to store boats at all. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yeah, she already does that on the other structure. Um, I did want to add, and I, I do talk about it in the application. There's no. Um, technically, it sort of it partially meets the definition of a marina. Uh, under the DES rules, um, but it does not have uh, underground fuel storage. Uh, there's no fueling there, uh, like a marina that you would think of, like uh, you know Wentworth by the Sea marina type of thing. 
Um, it's uh, there's no she doesn't pull boats and work on them there. She doesn't provide any of those services nor proposing any of those services. So it's more recreational based. Yep. Got it. Um, I had a question about so just a little bit about an alternative. So if you could speak to it a little bit, why you can't do it on the existing dock yeah. and float. Yeah, that's a fair question, and we, we did sort of go over that. Um, when you have several boats already attached to the existing structure, putting a finger float on that, trying to have people with kayaks get down that way and then get out on a finger float past people who were working on their boats, doing other things on their boats, it's more of a space issue. And she would like to separate that space so that people could bring their kayak down this gangway and be able to, like I said, safely get in it. Um, the, the slip spaces along what she has now are, are occupied. She either rents them and they have boats on them most of the time. So right now what she does is she kind of juggles can you walk down and walk 30 feet where that boat is not there right now because it's out to sea and can you launch there? So this provides her with that space that's kind of guaranteed on a daily basis. Um, thank you. So yes. it is only gonna be for launching kayaks, it's not gonna be? Yep, it's for her kayak business, business yep. And I'll ask the question the third time too because I just wanna like, it's not going to be used for putting anything on there as in seats or or anything like that they're not gonna I mean it, per the rules it, it can't be right yep. so as long as they they understand that yes yep and it is it will be a seasonal structure so it'll be removed during the non kayak season um, Sam has a question yeah yes yeah. um, is that twice the the width of the the current uh, structure? It just oh, seems question. very wide, and I'm I'm curious if there is that. I mean, does it need to be quite that wide? Yeah, it was ten feet wide. Okay. And I'm gonna guess that the existing float is probably six feet wide. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at a small plan too, but I know that the fixed pier portion is six feet wide, and yep. it does look like the float matches that width. Uh, the 10 feet wide so getting into floats and float stability mm -hmm. you need some width to have the stability when they get too narrow um, even though they're you not have... and they're not long enough yep so when you have a, a, a float that's not wide but also not very long then you you encounter a stability issue even though you seem to have quite a bit of um, pilings supporting it, one in each corner, it looks like, yep. correct? Still, yep. okay. So the piles just locate it and keep right. it in place. Right, Yep. Okay, thank yep. you. It's a good question, it's a fair question, yes. We have we went over, you know, should we be eight feet wide? Should we be 10 feet wide? Um, no, I, get, I understand for kayaks and a, probably a lot of them are tourists, so not like, the most agile kayakers. <laughs> my first time in a kayak i'm going to try to do that. this yeah i've i mean i've i've taken a kayak off of the traditional one that they gotcha. have there and i mean it was fine but i've also done it before so sure i i understand <laughs> yeah thank you and no no other questions or comments anybody want to make a motion Can I ask one other question? Yes. Does does this change the way they use the shoreline? Like, is there any launching from the shore currently of kayaks? Um, they could, but their tidal access, there, there's not a lot of water there. You know, we, we tried to give them something that would get them beyond that mean low water mark. Mm -hmm. um, so that at least there would be, you know, a foot of water for a majority of the tide for them. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other issue is there is a, um, or you can see there's a, a stone revetment around most of the property. Yeah. The yeah. northern portion of the property is like there's an old boat launch there. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not concrete, it's gravel. Um, so there is the opportunity to launch in that direction too, but you can see the mean low water lines quite a ways out from that. So 
Mm -hmm. uh, certainly there are, would be days and at high tide you, you could launch from shore for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the mean, the mean high, you can see the mean high water lines halfway up the slope. It's hard to see. Right. Maybe I can point it out, but. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Ah, uh, there I'll we go. So, so okay. this is mean high water here. Sorry. And then this other line that you see out here further is the mean low. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. Okay. Okay. I take it back. Okay. You take it back? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. I make a motion that we recommend approval of the State Wetlands Bureau application uh, for 41 Pickering Avenue. Thank you. Second? We'll second. Second. Any discussion? No. Okay. No discussion. We'll do a vote. Roll call. Um, Lynn? Yes. Yes. Allison? Yes. Samantha? Yes. Jess? Yes. And the chair votes yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know. We have another item on the agenda that we might want to move. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we move digital wetland delineation requirements to the front of, uh, to the first item on other business. Okay, thank you. Seconded? Second. Thank you. Um, Jess, we're going to do a vote. Or. Yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I caught you off guard. Usually sorry. she's last. Ted? Ted? Yes. Samantha? Yes. Allison? Yes. Abigail? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Yes. On chair votes, yes. All right, so the next item on the agenda is the other business, digital wetland delineation requirements. So um, I'll, I can ahead. start that. Um, Kate, feel free to come up and jump in if you want. But um, really between Kate and I, you know, we've been talking about trying to update our wetland maps. We have a grant in to, to get funding to do that citywide. But this is really an effort to do it on a case by case basis where they have a wetland scientist go out, do the delineation. Our citywide wetland delineation is not a delineation. It's a citywide map. So it's not as accurate as what the, they're providing. Our um, thought was right now we don't have it in the ordinance to require that. So we, we could ask applicants as they come in if they have it. You know, not everybody has to do a wetland delineation with a wetland scientist because we let some people use a, the city wetland map when it's really obvious they're in the buffer and saves them the expense. And then some people might get a wetland scientist but um, not have their plan digitized or able to be brought in. So. We're not asking at this point for them to change what they've done, but to provide us what they've done if they're, you know, if they're willing as a as a stipulation to the to the application. Um, so we thought we could start with that and then see how it goes, and then see how we want to update the ordinance in terms of requirements, whether it means requiring everybody get a delineation in the future, or whether it means just people that we might want to be more clear in the ordinance about who should do a delineation. It's kind of hard to draw that line, but it might be worth doing. And then um, where they do do a delineation and they have a survey that they can provide us, then we'd require they provide it. So this is a first step in that process. Um, but we thought it's only going to give us better information on our wetland delineation and it'll go right into our GIS. So we'll have access to it right when they apply and we can use that information to better it, review projects. Peter. Do we currently um, require that uh, building plans be digitized and provided to us in a digitized format? I think the only requirement is on a, a site review and subdivision. They have to provide a, a plan set in a digital format, a, an as-built in a digital format on a site review application. And also, I don't even know if they require it on subdivision. I think they might, but certainly on site review. But on an individual building permit, no, sometimes there is a reason they kick in a, a requirement for an as-built, a digital as-built, if they have to verify something or if there's some other requirement they're trying to meet, but it's not a, it's not a typical stipulation for building permits. So these will be able to go right into the GIS system so everything will be uh, coded and all that kind of stuff? Well, they'll have to be, digi you know, they're, they're digitized, they'll have to be brought in. So it'll be a little bit of a manual process, but yeah, we can do that part. I'm all supportive. I'm assuming it probably costs more to get 
your surveyor to digitize something if they don't need to digitize it. Would, I mean, is there any incentive from us to get, because they're just giving it out of their own goodness of their heart, really? Well, everybody now <laughs> does the does their plans in a, yep. not everybody, but most people do their plans in a digital format. Yep. So it's really just giving us a file yep. is what we see it as. But mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Yeah, there could be But if we start back. requiring it, then. Well, I think that we could, you know, again, limit it. So if you've got a single homeowner that's looking to modify their residence, they can use the city's maps potentially. But yep. if you're looking at something commercial or some larger development, yep. then that would have to be a digitized file. I think that we could probably bracket it. Yep. I like that. Okay. There are a number of jurisdictions nationally that just require everything to be digital. a digital yep. copy. You yep. know? Yeah. I mean, and building permits are digital. If that uh, maybe I didn't answer your question correctly, oh. so there is an online. You have to do an online building permit digitally, but in terms of a uh, as built or a site plan that shows a boundary of your property, that isn't necessarily a requirement. They can draw a sketch and then scan it and upload it. So it doesn't have to be a surveyed plan. Mm -hmm. Got it. But it does have to be digital. So I guess that's a distinction. Yeah, a scanned PDF is still digital, I guess. A scanned PDF or, is mean, digital, a, but a it's not. A scanned sketch is still digital, but <laughs> yeah. like not helpful for what we're trying to get at. Right, right. Any questions? Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I mean, we, we will end up having to vote on this, right? No, no. not right now. This okay. is just you another just, business item to just talk yeah. about it. All right. You'll so, have to vote on it if you make a stipulation that they provide it, but we don't have anything today that okay that would go with that yeah. right um so steve i think you wanted to speak to it for amanda yeah if i could just uh, make a couple comments I, I saw it on the um the staff memo for the the previous application um and then i saw it on your agenda um so i guess i was just curious as to how that information was going to be used once the city had it in their gis system and i think you kind of explained that a little bit peter i guess my hesitation would be is if let's for example take this this project here uh, has an HOTL which is technically a wetland delineation um, and let's say uh, the property owner across the street came to see you about a future conditional use permit application and they used our information mm -hmm. I think that starts to wander into a little bit of a slippery slope well um, it would be only on their property right you only provide that information to the property owner Correct. I guess what I'm saying is, let's say uh, I can't really read it because it's so small, but you know, let's say this property owner uh, wants to add a garage to their property, and they come in and they speak with you, oh. and you provide them with yeah. the GIS data that technically is owned by Esther's Marina LLC, hmm. and technically tied to my stamp. Hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. I I do like the the discussion that you you started with about requiring everybody to have a wetland scientist do a wetland delineation. I think that's really probably the way to go. Uh, they, <laughs> <Of course> too. <laughs> no, I don't want to work on all these projects. I'm, I'm busy enough. It's, it's, it's not a, it's not a work issue. Um, I just think it makes it cleaner. Yeah. Um, no, easier. That, that makes my, sense. my, my concern was more about how that information is going to be used. Yeah. Um, I do agree a hundred percent that, um, <clears throat> You know, there's a there's some some city wetland mapping now, and in my experience, it can be pretty inaccurate. Yeah. Based upon looking at a map and then me going on site, I mean, we're talking about. Yes. I, I've been on sites where it's could be 100 feet. Yeah. Um, which yep. is the width of the buffer. So. Yep. Um, and yes. we look at that with every application. So sure. It's not like it goes unnoticed, but. Yep. We're trying to improve that, and this was a step to. You know, use the the survey information to bring right. it closer. I guess we'll have to have that conversation with the legal department and see what we can require and what the ordinance requirement would be and what effect it would be upon a, a you know contractor who did the work going forward in the future. If we required that, does that remove their liability or create right. liability or you know that that kind of thing? But it is a good point. So it's yep. Glad, and you, just, said, glad you said something. Yeah, and to sort of an answer uh, Samantha's comments or questions about uh, the, the data mm -hmm. it's uh, the plans are on what's called state plane coordinates mm -hmm. so those coordinates get just they're sent right over the GIS yeah. so it's yeah it's a super accurate clean way to do it so but even that not everybody 
puts it into a known coordinate system, right? They could just do an independent survey and have a digital file that's accurate to the yeah. centimeter, but yeah. it's not tied into anything. So that makes it, then we'd have to no digitize benchmark. it and bring it in ourselves. And Yes, and that's why I was asking how, how the city would be using it. Would you, yeah. I would assume that you're not going to be providing those northerning and easting's to an applicant. So well, I think, they I think that covers you. If you handed them a piece of paper showing, yeah. that doesn't necessarily um, allow them to put it on the ground or put it on a plan. They'd have to tie it to the boundary somehow. So there's that. I think you're safe there, but well, I'm not an attorney. If, I wonder, so if, if, like you were mentioning, like a another neighbor needed a, the, a digitized plan and sees that it's already on the city GIS website right. and the question is whether they can or cannot use it could it be I mean maybe they have to go to the right now they would so if we engineer took it, that did it yeah. and have to get permission whatever that arrangement looks like for that it could to be used, that I mean that could work as well I guess with some sort of you know I would assume some sort of fee for you to relook at it again and make sure it's still like up still accurate date. yes yeah. yep so that could be another i don't know yeah i could. just think that'd be get awfully complicated yeah i agree. try to track it right yeah. i'm thinking if it if it if it comes in either voluntarily or by an ordinance requirement mm -hmm. it would then become public public information because the city is showing it on their gis map so yeah. it, we can't guarantee any you know proprietary assurance they'll get benefit from it um but it is it is a question for legal i think is there a way to do that do we do that in other things that work the same way because our site review requires it um so we have property boundaries they help to correct our they really help to correct our tax maps you know because our tax maps aren't all surveyed but when a site review plan comes in and they've surveyed the property boundaries and they look at the one next door and it's like five feet off then they figure out how to adjust it and move things around it's always a constant improvement but um yes i had that conversation with john before the meeting yeah to talk about this and yeah. he said well i have to do that with my property boundaries right huh. um on site right. plans mm -hmm. so if there's a lot line adjustment that information's got to be provided to the city and it's used to update your maps and yeah. i think everybody's fine with that i, th I just think it's the next mm -hmm. possibly the next use of it yep that's something that you know whether when the city takes ownership of it or you know use of it then does that free the right person who created the information from their yep. liability but that's that's the legal question perfect that's all i had i didn't want to no, muddy the water or no that's helpful <laughs> that's 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 go down a rabbit hole and yeah. take up more time but thank you yeah, appreciate it you gotta go down can i ask can i ask you a question actually sure. just because it's, it's, it's like a super interesting process right how things get delineated is there any scenario where because I, I think what you're saying is that like the site-specific delineation would then kind of replace the city's wetland plan and for that particular geography and is there any situation where like the city plan would be more accurate than what you do, do you, and it just seems interesting right to kind of like stitch together like a very patchy thing. yeah super site-specific in this month and this year and then the city plan and then oh here's another pocket where it was done a different year a different season a different delineator you... there are certainly variations between delineator to delineator yeah um i think that's why we have wetland buffers right because there is some variation that. should we all be within 10 feet yes um where where delineation probably gets the trickiest is on sites that have been disturbed by man right and i would think that probably most of the city's properties fall into that category so yeah. it can be it can be quite difficult i've I've been on sites where there's four sets of wetland flags. They're all different, and right. You know there is that variation as well um, that you can see literally on the ground. Um, I mean, you could we could have a, a four-hour workshop on this, but yeah. um, I guess also I I'm not quite sure where the city map how that was generated. I'm going to guess probably a combination of some NRCS soil survey combined with an aerial photo interpretation as well. I, I don't know how they... Yeah, it was aerial photo interpretation, field, field yeah. verification, so, to the extent that they could do it. Yeah. Um, so nothing's going to beat boots on the ground, in my opinion. Um, 
but with that said, like I, you know, there can be plenty of variation between who's on site and who does it. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that our, the way we did ours is not according to the 87 Corps of Engineers manual and the way that a wetland delineator is supposed to do it is using that manual. So that's by default is always going to be more accurate, mm -hmm. technically more accurate. Right. There might be cases where either seasonally or erosion or something came in to change things. So the timing might make ours more accurate, but it's not accurate because of the process. It's just a ch by chance it might happen. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's super interesting too in cases where it's like lawn, but probably would be a wetland. You know what I mean? Like all the time. <laughs> yeah. Like we, all the um, time. Yeah, yeah. That's that's probably the toughest thing to do, is to um, you know look at a lawn area that is clearly has hydric soils. Uh, personally, just just for context. Um, I always look at it as if somebody were to stop maintaining the lawn, then we would certainly have the vegetation within a short period of time that right. tells you you're standing in a wetland. Right. So yeah. look at something other than the plants. Yep. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. yeah. Cool. People cut it to hope that it won't stay a wetland. There's that too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. Uh, most of our golf courses are... And the seacoast around the yeah. sea. they're in the same boat. They they maintain an area that's certainly contains hydric soils. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a section in the manual that deals with that. That's a right. whole another <laughs> which really says throw out all the criteria and use your best professional judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and, and I'm Great. Also, Thank you. <laughs> I'm also curious if you're seeing any like changes, any sort of consistent right? I mean you expect kind of that like wetland line to be changing right with sea level rise and with climate change um a little bit yeah sure a little bit on the sea coast and, so yeah. hotl is a different animal in terms of, of of how it's um identified in the field um you know it's the furthest landward line of debris washed ashore by tidal action mm -hmm. presence of sulfitic materials within the soil profile which is pretty obvious when you dig a hole it just smells like sulfur right. um uh, the presence of uh, vegetation that typically grows in areas that are inundated by salt water. So it's the combination of all those things. Again, it's not great. I wish the state would just pick an elevation. Maine picks an elevation, and that's what they use. Um, because you can go on a site, and there may be a, um, you know, a, a rack line, a debris line. But you don't know when that debris line was deposited. It could have been from a hurricane that was 800 miles offshore. Um, so that's not always the most reliable indicator. Um, I have seen some changes. I think the biggest change that I see is, um, is there, there tends to be, uh, I see more Phragmites, particularly in rye. Mm. And I, Phragmites doesn't like, and it's not very salt tolerant. Um, and I see that proliferation of that, that edge of Phragmites around the salt marshes just seems like it's getting wider and wider and wider. Um, I know there's been some projects where they're trying to introduce more salt water into those areas, which is going to going to going to take out that Phragmites. It's going to, in a natural in a natural way, sort of knock it down. Um, but I have seen some changes in terms of freshwater. Um, you don't see a lot. Um, I mean, I haven't seen a lot, but there's areas that have been impounded, beaver activity, things like that. Certainly. Um, you can see in a short period of time. By short, I mean five years, ten years. Unfortunately, I'm not on a lot of sites for that duration, but I do have some some monitoring responsibilities where I've or I've been on a neighboring site and look over there and go, oh yeah, well that looks different. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, no, it's That's dynamic. Cool. There's it's no neat. question. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you for you. your thank input. You. Yeah, thanks for your input and thanks for staying. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Steve. Okay. Next item is the CIP funds discussion. If I can get the order right. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. So, and um, for that one, I just have the update from me on um, the letter to the city councilors um, requesting, as was voted at the last meeting that we had in September, to ask for the uh, request for the $500,000 for land acquisition item in the budget in the CIP. So um, that has been sent to the city council and the mayor and the um, 
and city manager. City manager. Yep. So I will speak to it at the planning board meeting, right? I don't know if you yeah. found out any more information on that. Uh, no, December and then um, city council in December, I, I believe, as well. In but December? Okay. Yeah. That's when they vote, though, right? Right. But they'll have a public hearing. When they vote. Yeah. But okay. I'll get you the actual dates of it. Too, yeah, I've actually got them here. It's actually November 17th. 2022, it goes to the planning board for a CIP information meeting, and I assume that they take testimony at that meeting. I think they might, but they also, that's not when they adopt, they vote to send it to the council, or I think there might be two meetings, but that's what I got to check is which. I got to, which it is the we'll schedule. Anybody who wants to know when it's happening, let me know. Do you want to come on? I would. I also want to mention, though, that. Um, November, I'm going to be at a trial in um, Minnesota, so I'm probably not going to be here for the December meeting. Okay. And Allison, I, can you I'll send, send an, an email? email. <laughs> I think it's this one. I uh, think it's the December 15th planning board meeting. I, I so think you're right, one, because December last one? year I was getting November. ready to okay. say something for that meeting. When yeah. I figured out that yeah. it, didn't, it wasn't in there. So it's December 15th for the planning board. What did it say about the council public hearing? Does it say that date? Uh, it's in February. In February. Oh, okay. We'll get you those dates. But it'll be December 15th for the planning board, and then we'll get you the date for the council. And if there's anything that you want me to add to when I present it, in addition to what's on the letter, let me know. Um, I thought it was excellent. Very well written. I guess my Thank you for your help, Allison, on doing that well, and your points. And I'm sure. I guess my question is, how do we arrive at $500,000? A year ago, the Conservation Commission unanimously recommended a million dollars to be put in the CIP plan for every year. So how did we arrive at 500000 this year? I thought it was $500,000, we said. We started I, at a million. That's what I remembered. Was we started at a million and went down to 500000 uh, I, I could commission. pull it up, but I, I, I've actually yeah. gone back and checked, and it was a million dollars. So anyway. <clears throat> yeah, and I think there was pushback to get us down to the... 500,000, I think, so. I don't remember. I remember it being, starting at a million and going down to 500, but I, I'd have to go back and look at the minutes. So, so yeah. So, um, I mean, I think the, the approach is that you, it's not just for this year. It's for every year. Each year, so You right? build up a fund and then decide, you know, do you want to keep doing that or do you have enough for projects and how many projects are coming in and, um, you know, the it seems like it's good to keep it on the agenda to keep building the conservation fund because you're not going to keep building it through development. At some no. point, that's going to run up. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in huge support. I don't think it's enough. Um, I so. wanted to bring up, too, that uh, the city of Dover is looking at um, if developers want to increase density on their property, that they pay for it and that that, pro that money goes into a conservation fund. Mm -hmm. oh. So it's just another way we might be able to. Are you talking about the wastewater plan they have? No, I'm not talking about okay. that. I'm talking about just the city of Dover saying that if they want to increase density on their properties, that they need to pay for it. And um, right. You know, so instead of going for supporting density is actually good for the climate in that you can protect the other areas, mm -hmm. but you need to have the money to be able to protect those areas. Yeah, so instead of going for a variance, they can they can pay a certain amount to get to a density level. So, you know, like they might say one single family home per 7,500 square feet, and if they don't have enough square footage on their property, instead of going for a variance to put multiple, prop, you know, single family homes or whatever on one property, they can pay for that density, basically, um, which would be the same similar to going to get a variance for that density, but they'd be paying. And that, yeah. And it could be a designated fund, so. Yeah, we can look at that as part of a zoning, you know, review or. Well, and I think Andrew had brought it up too, just having it in, similar to that, but without even the incentive part is the developers come in and they pay a fund, a fee, for doing just development mm -hmm. with, to the conservation fund, which other, towns and cities do too so you mean there's a development fee yeah oh hmm. but i don't know about that i can check into that 
Well, we have the change of use. Isn't that sort of a development fee? That, that yeah, certainly. I mean, that's a that's a they call it a current use penalty. So it's a penalty for taking something out of current use at 10% of the value of the property. And the state law says you can do that and you can put up to 100% of that penalty into your conservation fund. And some communities put it into the general fund, some communities put it all in the conservation fund like we do, or some communities do a split. So some of it goes to the general fund, some of it goes to their conservation fund. And in Portsmouth, you said it all goes to conservation? Yeah, 100% in Portsmouth goes, to cons goes into a co the conservation fund. That there's not a lot of land left. Yes. So that source is running out. Yeah. Right, it's more like it's redevelopment sort of is what we're seeing. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind checking on that with the increased density part, Peter? What Dover does? Yeah. Sure. I can check on just the straight development thing. Um, and then the other part of this. CIP funds discussion, I think, um, was that, um, in your packet you saw the capital improvement plant program. Uh, I think it's resident suggestions forms that Ted had done. I think he asked to be to have that included in the packet. Yeah, and, and actually, kind of, in, and that's one of the reasons why I pulled out the CIP schedule. And it it leads me to think that uh, we should uh, move on our schedule next year to have a broader conversation about things that we might want to recommend uh, in a broad sense. So I'll, let me talk about some of these because I think there are things that I would hope that this commission would think of supporting, you know, uh, or and certainly next year maybe have a broader discussion about some of these issues. Uh, <clears throat> but there's a couple. Uh, one is uh, including funding for a commercial grade steamer like they use in Europe. They've got these big huge steam machines which kill all the weeds uh, on these things and they travel at a pretty high rate of speed. So like Dover now has a steam machine. They built it themselves. It's a big steamer uh, and it goes on the back of the truck and they go around and they kill weeds with it so they don't have to use any type of pesticides to kill the weeds. Sidewalks. Yeah, on the sidewalk, the edges of the roads, they, they, it was pretty innovative, but they made it themselves, and it's not fast and efficient. There's these machines, they're about $25,000, but less than the cost of a packer, for instance, that move at a pretty high rate of speed. So every brick sidewalk everywhere, market square, the benefit is it not only kills the weeds, it sanitizes all the sidewalks. Uh, and then they have attachments where you can use them in other places. And they have year-round uh, uh, uses, too, to uh, loosen up, uh, you know, uh, pipes and to loosen up uh, uh, caps on, on, uh, on, street, on streets and things like that. And take off graffiti on buildings. It's very efficient in taking graffiti off buildings. So I'd like to, I, I think it would be a good thing. I've looked into it for years. I've talked to Peter Rice about it. So yeah, I'd love to have one, but we don't have the money, you know. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I would love to uh, uh, see if people would be willing to support that, or the commission would be. The other one that I have is uh, uh, a, a deep uh, tine aerator. And I got this completely from Peter Rice. Uh, we were going to the same gym last year, and I used to see him on Wednesdays. And I was saying there might be some potential grant funds out there for new equipment. I was hearing from Stonyfield and asked him, is there something that you guys really want? And he said, yeah. He said, we want a deep tine aerator. Well, that is, none of the fields really here uh, are aerated annually. They're not. If you walk in any of the park, it's hard as a rock, you know. It's, they we don't have the resources for a person to go around area individually, but they have these deep tine aerators. It's like a machine. They're very efficient. They go through and twice a year you could aerate all of your fields and parks. So Peter actually sent me a cost estimate that uh, he had done by uh, one of the city's uh, arborists and uh, of $42,000. So that was a pretty sound number on it for a deep tine aerator. Uh, <clears throat> The other one that I had was to transition 500000 a year, the same what we're talking about for 
purchasing land, which isn't much, to transition the city to all electric. You know, we're getting to the season where you're going to hear the whining of, you know, leaf blowers and everything else, and then you have lawnmowers in the summertime, and today it's very efficient and you can make the transition. It's not the high cost that it used to be, and you've got different types of charging stations and electric charging infrastructure that's growing. And I was looking at what some other communities do, and they've been transitioning over from gas to electric. And in the last one, I propose almost as an alternative to our $500,000. Um, there's a, 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 a very, very uh, effective program in, in Massachusetts where you can, they can set aside, you decide if you want to be a community preservation community or not. And uh, 189 communities out of 351 in Massachusetts have signed up in the last six years alone since they passed the legislation. What the legislation does, it allows you to set aside voters can vote to say, let's set aside 1% or 2%, up to 2% a year, uh, and for a property acquisition that can be used not just for land conservation, but can be used for recreation and also historic preservation. Our historic preservation needs, I, I don't believe, are that great here, but certainly for recreational land, we don't have a pot to just buy stuff when it's out there, you know, and that's the community uh, 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 campus is an example. We were stuck. We didn't have the wherewithal to you know, purchase that. We had. We were fortunate that federal funds were around. So it's a very. It's modeled after that program. I propose one percent, which is one point three million a year, and people in mass look at. It, okay, I voted the one percent increase once. After that, it's already built into the base, and my taxes aren't going up in the future years. It's just that first year. So anyway, I think it's a pretty good model, and uh, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think half a million dollars is much. Anyway, it's open for discussion. Thank you. Any discussion? I, yes. I only wanted to mention that I also had submitted a um, a proposal regar regarding tree planting, and that the city be able to use its buying power to work with residents that would like to have trees on their property or an additional tree, that there be um, one, and I, I think you may be right, Peter, that there there are a number of, I mean, there's supposed to be a number of trees that the city plants in the city each year, but um, I'm talking about enabling residents, you know, and if, uh, you know, we have a city arborist, the arborist could work with the homeowner on the types of trees that are available that do well in this area if they're unsure. Um, just I think that to encourage homeowners to plant trees is a good thing, and if we can help them in some way by reducing their cost, um, you know, buy it at city cost, then that would be advantageous. I think it's a neat idea. Did you see that? And it, it's a growing movement now in the United States that they're planting uh, fruit trees. You know, not not just ones with leaves on them. You know, which I think is kind of interesting, and then anybody's can take them when they're right. Yeah. yeah, I did see that. That's great. Lots of good energy for ideas. And any other discussion? Questions or anything? No? And I, Peter, you had, um, I think, gotten some more information on the follow-up for those ones that are submitted by residents, um, opportunities like the public input opportunities as follow-up? Oh, uh, yeah, the, the, I mean, I think typically they put those at the end of the CIP and, and I don't know how much they focus on them. This year the council is making a more concerted effort to bring up the resident um, CIP requests and they'll have that on, on an upcoming agenda, I think, at their two, two council meetings, one. Um, but they're going to go through them. The council is going to go through, look at them more specifically than they have in the past. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. So there's an opportunity for public input more to, to speak to it, or just for them to bring it up into the public forum a little bit more. I think right. is what the goal is that the council talks about them instead of just adding them to the back of the CIP document. Yeah. So if we want to kind of help this process of advocating for the conservation 
fund. What's, is it helpful to have more people come to these meetings? Sure. Or what, what yeah, is I mean, the right I, you know, lever? <laughs> they don't, you know, if you can make it short and sweet, there's a lot of items in those, and those meetings go pretty long. But yeah, I think more people will come speak to an item, it just gets more attention, mm -hmm. for sure. So like the same time that Barbara goes to have the planning board one will be December 17th and the city council will be when they have their public hearing, which I'll have to get the date they mm -hmm. get when they schedule that for the CIP public hearing, which is the final document. But the planning board is when they, planning board sort of puts it all together, the board that puts it all together, and they send it off to the city council on the 17th to make that vote to recommend the CIP to the council. That's the date that they're shooting for. That's on their, that's the date that's on the calendar. So if we were to pick one meeting to go to, which would it be? <laughs> uh, you know, the I don't know. I would say either one really have this similar, but the the plant the city council is going to close out all the final ones, so it might get knocked off before it gets to the city council if it's something that, or we I mean at the city council. Usually not. Usually the planning board recommendations go to the council and they approve them. I don't think there's a, usually a lot of shit. So I would say the planning board is your first chance at it. And then if you if you, if you you like how that goes or it doesn't take too much of your time, you can go to the council also, you know. Which planning board meeting might it be at? November 17th. December 17th? December 17th. No, no, well, November 17th, it says planning board CIP public information meeting. Yeah, I don't know what that means. I think that's just the presentation of all the items in the CIP, yeah, and okay. then the December seventeenth meeting is where they vote to send it to the, so plan, Decem the December fifteenth, right? Okay, got it. Okay, I think that's, that's okay. That's, that's more what likely I was... where they'll take public input. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, okay. And then the council has a public hearing, so they'll take public input there. Okay. Anything else on that? No, oh. it's just you know this is the first. Well, last year, I guess, is the first year that we've even engaged with the CIP, so it's all, it's all new to the commission, but probably good things coming from it. Yeah, especially from individuals and then support for yeah. the individuals. If people want to do that, let them know. Anybody, because they do. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so then our next item would be standardizing site walks, which I think is yours, Peter. Yeah, uh, we basically talked about it. Um, in the context of the site walk for um, for Bridges Court, basically we want to try to make it a regular thing to have a site walk a week before the meeting, so that we just keep putting on the calendar. It's so people are aware of it. It seems like a good time to do it, and then we don't have to do doodle polls and remember to do that. Yeah. Um, so we're shooting for the week before at 3:30. Um, so it'll be the Wednesday, the first Wednesday of the month, I guess, at 3:30 would be the goal. And then so, there may or may not be something to visit. Is that kind of how it's? We're going to, you know, if the applicants can't do it, we might have to pick, move the date. But if, you know, at least we'll have a date that we can shoot for. A every standing month. date every month. Try to make it a standing date every okay. month. That's the goal. Yep. And would we try to see, like, all of the projects that were on the yep. agenda? That would be the goal, too. But, you know, <laughs> some, of these are, some of these get long. So we'll try to make them quick and tell the yeah. applicant we don't want a long presentation by it your wetland mm -hmm. scientist or something. We just want to see the site quickly and know what we're going to be, you know, it's really nice to see a site in the field and I think it always benefits the commission when That's they see places. Yeah. So yeah. just trying right. to encourage that and get and the applicant. I think what Sam suggested is also yeah, really having great everything if they can mark out something out so that we can go there and know yeah. exactly yeah. where yeah. it is instead of them out. looking at their map. They're not spending time like looking at their map being like, okay, I think it's right there. Right. It just takes time and if it was already staked out, then. Yep. Yeah, like it's easy. Yep. As much as possible can be staked out. Yeah, make it as efficient as yeah. you can. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that one's that one, right? And then the, the next one is the digital wetland delineation requirements. Is that you? Or no, Kate? we already did we that. We did that was with that was the so first one. We're question. all set. Yeah. Well, there was one thing, though. Do you guys want us to decide on something? That's what I was wondering. No, we put it in as a recommendation for a stipulation in the work session for when that comes in as a regular application. Okay, I'm um, thinking, I'm sorry, I'm thinking the boundary mark marker. Oh, signs. the boundary marker we haven't talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that would more be Kate or you. Well, are you talking about it? 
Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think it's towards the back of the packet, but so I was talking. Page 126. Talking. Sorry? Page 126. Yeah. Wow, thank you very much. Kate, Ed. you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Yes, Kate O'May, Associate Environmental Planner. Um, Actually, 123, so, but. <laughs> Peter and I were talking about how there is a requirement in the very back of the environmental protection standards in the zoning ordinance for boundary markers. And so we're going to try and start getting more applicants to really abide by that and have them on their plans and it also requires them to sh um, install them during construction so i talked to kristen murphy who's the exeter conservation commission um, staff representative because she and the exeter conservation commission has been doing this and they a long long time ago she doesn't even remember when they bought it bought a bulk amount of wetland boundary marker signs from a company in mass and they have yet to run out of them, but basically they get them for a very low cost um, and sell them for $5 each to developers or applicants. And they require them to put them every 50 feet um, along, I believe, the buffer line for Exeter. I might be wrong about that, but we are not quite thinking about distance yet, like 50 feet or anything, but we think it would really, it'd be a really good idea to do at least a trial run and order maybe a hundred of these signs they're relatively affordable and just have a stockpile of them pick a design that we like stick with it and maybe sell them for the same amount five dollars to applicants maybe one or a few with every application depending on the size of the buffer boundary that they're looking at so we have these are examples from the Massachusetts company there's two pages of examples and there's an example from Rowley Massachusetts they order from there as well but I think we were talking, Peter and I, about a Portsmouth one that is just very simple, says something like city of Portsmouth, environmentally sensitive area or wetland sensitive area, something like that with very basic um, logo. But then also um, the city manager, Karen, also was thinking that a city seal might be nice to put on these. And these are, these are pretty small. I think they're about five to eight inches. You can get a small or a large one, but they're pretty pretty small. Um, and they just require two two screws, and usually just put on a post. It might be a wooden post, whatever we decide. But okay, yep. What's the material? What are they made out of? These are, I believe, metal. But I think you might be able to request plastic ones. I'll have to talk to the the company. No, rep. no plastic. No, yeah, right. I agree. Would, would I agree. I, I was I like, that's just bad. Yeah, something. but I, I think they're just like simple tin. <laughs> like the street the sign yeah. material or something? Sorry? The street sign material. Yeah, maybe. exactly. I think pretty pretty thin. And, but I mean, Exeter, Arlene. Kristen Murphy was saying they work great and they've been doing them for as long as she's been there. So I think they like it. And she also mentioned that they've been getting, or while she's been there, she also has received a lot of questions from just residents in town and community members saying, oh, what does that mean? Like when they see a right. sign. So it's raising awareness at the same time for the wetland areas and the sensitive areas around town. So just thought it would be a good thing we can start doing or at least. <laughs> yeah, since they always ask about. us what the sign needs to say and things yeah. like that. So uh, the right. one that I like best is it says protected wetlands, no disturbance, city of Portsmouth in the middle, Conservation yeah. Commission. I, th yeah. I think that's a great yeah, protected that's wetlands. pretty straightforward, the, I think. Yeah. That one. Or egret. Yep. The simpler yes. the better, maybe. No, and no yeah, disturbance and for sure. No disturbance. Yeah, yeah I, I well, think the instruction is really imperative yeah. because people if it's just like a sensitive wetland area well what does that mean you know you know so yeah the do not disturb you mean or no disturbance instruction yeah yeah i think even no disturbance yeah. is better i like the do yeah, not it disturb says no disturbance cut. on the bottom yeah i was going to say maybe do not disturb or whatever and so no disturbance i mean it, you basic i think it needs to have a command but i like the graphics of the yeah or we could do something similar to the, the middle one the do not disturb or cut Mm -hmm. I, don't know cut. Yep, that's a good one. I like yep. the cut part. I feel like it's yeah. very specific and actionable. Yeah. So okay. you know what you mean by disturbance. And it's telling you not to do it as opposed to the no disturbance. Um, is it's like it's almost like don't it's even not look telling over here. you not to do it. Yeah. It's like an area of no disturbance or something. It's like, oh well, I'm gonna go in and okay. do you know, whatever. You know, I get more concerned but, about dumping. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if people are gonna think that I can dump something there and I'm not disturbing it or something, but that's 
Hmm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like people with their grass clippings. Pretty commonly found in the wetland area. <laughs> yeah. Do not disturb, dump, or cut. Yeah. Now we're getting worried. <laughs> but I, yeah. <laughs> so, there's like a it's gotta be concise. five foot list. <laughs> yeah, of do what not. To do below. <laughs> yeah. Disturbs kind of. Because people don't seem to get the point sometimes. <laughs> okay. So, so we could do more of the middle one with do not disturb or cut on the bottom and then um, maybe the city seal thrown in there in the yeah. middle. Yeah, we'll see if we can fit the city seal. I think that might be good. Yeah. Okay. Or do not disturb and, uh, in you know, any way. <laughs> <laughs> don't even look at it. <laughs> the, uh, the way the ordinance is written, we ask people to show it on their plan, which they're not doing. We're trying to get them to start doing it more mm -hmm. um, because every wetland is a little bit different in how yeah. it lays out, so it, it's helpful if we can... But maybe we'll have to start, you know, telling them where they need to put them as part of the process, make it yeah. as a stipulation, mm -hmm. you know, show locations. I We've done that before, the terms of spacing and where they go. And it, it, I guess I'm not really clear on whether it would be a problem for them to nail these into a tree or is that going to damage the tree? That's what yeah, I'm I, I, it depends on what the nails are made out of. There's they, a benefit they can from be a long-term standpoint versus a wooden stake that's going to fall over. Right. But, is it going to damage a tree? And so would right. we specify no copper Right, if we could no specify what something. type of nail they put in it. And not to nail it all the way in either. Yeah. So that it's kind well, of dangling. Well, if we're giving them the sign, we give them the way to we give them it. the, yeah, yep. instructions. Attachments. And say you must use these nails. Do not substitute. Because <laughs> <laughs> somebody's going to do um, Or, and would a screw be better than a nail? But, um, uh, what about, because um, when you're the open space, um, what about on a stone? Could somebody, I thought of that we, when that hmm. was happening before, but I thought I'll leave that comment alone for a while. Well, we did a oh. plaque, we've done plaques on stones, and we did that for conservation land. The, the Sagamore Headlands piece has a plaque that's attached to the stone. Mm -hmm. So it's possible. I so, just don't know if a typical homeowner is going to yeah. have the resources to do that. or the, Not the resources, but the know-how. Yeah. Do it. I don't even know how they did it. I think it was pins they might have drilled in and then cemented somehow. The easiest thing is a stake in the ground, but yeah. Yeah. Sorry, is this for the wetland or for the buffer? <laughs> or are we doing both? Or... It depends. I, I always think. get confused. Well, no, I think it. it we left it, it in, intentionally ambiguous because every project's a yeah. little different, and and you know they might be 50 feet into the buffer, so. If they put a sign on the buffer, it might be in their front yard. Right. So the room. idea on the side is, of their house. Or their living <laughs> house. So the in the front. Protected <laughs> wetlands kind of leaves it open. You know, you're either at the buffer of the protected yeah. wetlands or you're in at the edge of the protected wetlands, and it just highlights the point at which you cross into a natural area. I think. Because a lot of times, also, it goes through right through someone's lawn, and no one's going to want to yeah. put that in their lawn. No, and I don't think that's what. Yeah. Goal so I mean, is. that's that's what I think is negotiable. Yeah. Okay. Because like. They can mow their lawn. That's technically cutting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it should be at the edge of the lawn. Be nice if they didn't. Yeah. They be nice if they the didn't. <laughs> they planted their or whole new buffer. buffer yeah. Right. Okay. So we asked them to plant. So yeah. that's why it'd be nice for them to show it on the right. plan, and we can decide if that's yep. adequate or not. Okay. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Um, so are okay. we good on that? Yeah, are we good. I like should the we... graphics of the middle one, though. Yeah. My PowerPoint skills aren't that great, so but. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think okay. it's great. All right, thank you idea. so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. It's a great okay. idea. So our next item on the agenda is the update on the conservation lands non-public session. Does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make Allison? a motion that we go into non-public session. Second. Seconded. And, oh gosh, um, roll call on the vote. Lynn? Lynn, yes. Abigail? Yes. Allison? Yes. Samantha? Yes. Ted? Yes. And Jess? Yes. And the chair, chair votes. I have a question. Can I still be a part of this or? Yes. I don't see how. I don't know. Okay. Uh, we no? can call you on a cell phone. Oh, okay. Can so, we can we call you? I mean, somebody can update me later if that's easier. I doesn't I don't need to complicate things, but I think you can you're part of the commission, so you <laughs> certainly could be um, a cell phone. Uh, a cell okay. Phone. We'll call you. We'll
Thumbs up. Okay. okay, next motion to. I, I'll make a motion to um, close the minutes of the non public session. Seal the Seal. minutes. Seal the minutes. Okay. Okay. Second. I said. Yep. <laughs> Second. Um, okay. Roll call vote is um, uh, Lynn. Yes. 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 Uh, Bill. Yes. Allison. Yes. 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 Sam. Ted. Yes. And Jess. You may have lost Jess. Yes. Yay. Oh. Right. Your votes. Yes. Okay. She's great. Back. All right. Okay. So we're back. So any other items on other business? Yeah, I I do. Uh, a few meetings ago, we were just going to have on on every meeting on the agenda, just a very quick update on our uh, organic land management program. And I just wanted to give you a real quick update and just get real quick feedback, is that we had a meeting yesterday, uh, Diana Papanoni, myself, and Jeremy from uh, uh, NOFA, Connecticut, that oversees the accreditation program. And as I, we mentioned at, at one of the meetings, that for the first time ever, they're going to hold a live uh, at, uh, accreditation program in New Hampshire. They've never held one, and they're going to hold it here in Portsmouth, um, which is really cool. And they're talking about sometime this winter, February, maybe March, something like that. And, uh, you know, we're, we're t talking about who we're going to reach out to to get support, things like that. But I, I just wanted to verify that, you know, one of the one of the list, one of the official sponsors of this is the Conservation Commission sponsoring this training program in conjunction with NOFA. And I think we're going to have like CLF and others are going to sponsor too, you know. But just planning it ahead. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody at the library or anything yet. If anybody has any ideas, it's a four day course. It usually runs from nine to four. Um, uh, and we expect 30 to 40 students, which would be a great turnout uh, if we promote it enough when we want to promote it with the Niantra Landscape Association. We've, there's been some discussions with them. Uh, everybody's who, pretty who excited it about to, it. Who is it geared to, Ted? What's that? Who is it geared to, toward? Oh, this is geared to uh, landscaping professionals that want to get accreditation. So if we're going to tell people, you got to do it right, and there's no one that they can hire to do it right, you know, so it's like a chicken and egg thing, right? right. So this is the chicken, right? Okay. And we're working to get the chicken going so that we can, and they already have lists of accredited people, and there's quite a few in, in New Hampshire, you know, and in Maine, but, uh, in, in a mass, but there, you know, this is to get the whole thing going. So we'll be looking for, you know, a place for four days. You know, I don't know where, I was going to talk to the library to start with, I don't know. Um, Is there any meeting space at Creek Farm? Um, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. That's they a good idea, too. They do? Yeah, in the, uh, another building there, they do. It's probably about the same size as the library would be. The Urban Forestry Center. Well, it's nice or to not Urban Forestry Center, Center the uh, Discovery Center. Discovery yeah. Center, sorry. Yeah, yeah we've got a great space. Like, wrong place. Yeah, yeah, Discovery Center, yeah. Discovery Center, yeah. Yeah, but because couldn't if, you do it at the Urban Forestry Center? Because they yes, do have so also Urban Forestry Center, could, too. You're right. If, if I'm coming in here from out of town, Right? Do I want to go to the Urban Forestry Center, or do I want to be in within walking distance of downtown? Yeah, the downtown yeah. library would be great, but yeah, you can get that space. Urban Forestry Center yeah. is pretty nice too. So you can go hiking. That's true. I know. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> so on that note, though, were we going to have a meeting on the nineteenth? I think tentatively. I don't know if uh, Kate. I saw yeah. it in the notes. Which, right. I mean, look. the nineteenth. I have it for the nineteenth. At 3.30. 3.30, which is the same day that we were going to go to the site visit? No, right. that was November 2nd. Okay. I think. Can you do right. the 19th, Ted? Uh, for uh, that meeting? For our Except regular meeting, meeting for the... For the site visit? No. Uh, for the education thing? Yeah. Yeah, we can. This is October? But I'll, October. I'll October. be October honest 19th. that, you know, there's, there's not much more to share than what we've talked about, you know? Well, there was the website that she presented and then... Oh, so, yeah. Is Alan still with us? Is our IT director still with us? I saw the announcement that we now have some new IT person. Yeah, Alan's still here. I also have some things, um, ordinance ideas too. Okay. For that meeting, okay. subcommittee meeting. Oh, that's right. We can talk a little bit about the brochure a little bit, maybe. Yeah. I don't and know. Was that, what was the date on that? The October nineteenth. At three thirty. Yeah. Oh, okay. So coming up soon. Yeah. yeah like next a week, week from today. And I think there was. Was there a meeting at the end of September? That I missed. 
if there was. You gotta post that. Uh, no. no. Okay. All right. You that makes me feel tomorrow. better. <laughs> okay. End of August, no. beginning of September. I'm still in my oh, we'll away zone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was afraid of. And then I like can um, come up with an agenda. You want me to come up with an agenda? I'll come up with a draft agenda. Or you, yeah. That would be great. Because you yeah. weren't at the last one. Yeah, so. send it to us. We're going to post it. Okay, probably okay. the end of this week or early next week. Okay. And find a space. Okay. And any uh, other other business? No? Okay. Thank you. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion that we adjourn. I'll second. And all those in favor? Yes. Yes. Aye. 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 Bye, Jess. Bye, Bye Jess. Bye, Jess. Oh. <laughs>